We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long form conversation. Welcome to All That To Say. My name is Jim Lyon. We are so glad you're here, and I am so totally pumped because our guest today, though separated from me in my studio in the center of the country, and he's resident on the far west coast in Southern California, is someone right here in my face. I can't believe I'm talking to the Nate Parker. Nate, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Well, he says, it's my pleasure. That's what he said at the beginning. We hope he says the same at the end, but I promise you, we are so uh, honored to have you with us. And uh, Nate is someone who has made a mark for himself already in uh, the industry of entertainment, and especially in film. He has been on both sides of the camera. He has directed. He has been a screenwriter. He has been an actor. He has been a visionary. He has been a voice and an advocate. I mean, at so many levels, uh, Nate Parker is actually changing the trajectory of the way in which some people, maybe even many people, think and see both the art of film and the messages and the passions that he carries and communicates. And Nate, I'm not just uh, uh, trying to flatter you. I'm just, I'm just saying, as the person who lives far away from Hollywood, I, I have understood and felt the impact of what you do. And I'm so glad to be able to help unpack that. But before we go into where, you're, where you are today and how your professional career has unfolded, tell us about Nate Parker. Where did he come from? What's your family? What's the story uh, of Nate Parker growing up? Well, first I'll say thank you for those kind words. I'll do my best to live up to them in this interview. Um, a little bit about me, I, I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, I grew up in a household. I'm the only boy of five. I have four younger sisters. Um, really tight knit family, but big family across Hampton Roads and the seven cities. Um, big military town, a lot of military family. Um, not always a lot of opportunity. I grew up in a, a housing development called Tidewater Park yeah. uh, in a city where when they want to uh, change the social status of a city rather than changing the opportunities they changed the name so uh it was changed to tidewater gardens because i believe that sounded a little better uh but nothing really changed it was it was tough coming up in that environment um environment that really uh encouraged thinking around escape rather than development and cultivation um and so uh, a lot of us are in my generation as i saw above me with my uncles and aunts and those around me, the main goal was to escape, make as much money as possible, uh, and, and never come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that has created, in many ways, uh, a flight of those who uh, are blessed enough to be able to move on to different areas, opportunities, and circumstances. So that that was my my er, my early days. Uh, and then at some point, my mother married my stepfather, who was also in the military. So I had the opportunity to travel around the country a bit and eventually got into sports uh, as my ticket out of uh, that community that I come from and ended up getting a scholarship. Uh, and it was in school that I recognized that I knew very little about my culture and my people. You know, I took an African-American studies class mm -hmm. and that was the first time I learned about Nat Turner, which was ironic because uh, Nat Turner's rebellion happened, you know, 30 miles away from where I grew up. Was your own home. So yes. uh, yeah, my, my hometown, you know, it was, it was it was really frustrating um, and infuriating in some ways because you know not often do we learn about those who had such impact on our communities in the country. Um, so much of our education when we're in school, um, specifically as a black man, is around uh, those who kind of perpetuated the oppression that you've been conditioned to accept. Uh, and so a lot of my up upbringing was kind of this disconnected sense of what America was. Uh, with respect to what I was actually living. And so it was when I when I arrived at college and started to take these courses that I realized that uh, there was much that had been held away from me. Uh, and so, you know, 
my first, I remember meeting with my advisor when I arrived and my goal was very clear, make as much money as you can go back, save your family and get them out of that community. And I remember sitting with her and she asked me what, what I'd like to major in, you know, what I would like to study. And I said, whatever makes the most money, you know? And, and I remember saying, that's not a good way of looking at it. And I said, well, you have no idea where I've come from. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I was very one track minded, you know, got my degree in uh, like the computer science field, management science, information systems. Um, and then, you know, after I started taking these courses, uh, I started to, there, there was a, a bit of an awakening in, in me, not from a creative sense, but more so from a spiritual sense, you know, knowing that someone like a Nat Turner could be on fire for God, but still be a revolutionary uh, and still be so rooted in his ideas, ideals, his, 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 his morality and his understanding of what God had destined for his life was transformative to me as a human. So he very quickly became my hero. This is aside from create the creator because I never knew I was destined to be a creator. Right. Uh, but you're then, connected to the story, uh, the narrative. I, I connected to the narrative, to his accomplishments, to you know the pastor that fights against uh, slavery and gives his life. Where's that story? That seems like something that we should lead with in the faith and uh, and and in, in school. You know, from the standpoint of of of, of truth. Uh, and so that was kind of my introduction to, you know, a story that changed my life, a mentality shift that has become kind of like the hallmark of my existence uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to using my art to really, um, you know, walk into and live inside of a riotous disposition toward injustice and to do it with, with you know, with the, 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 the learnings and teachings of Christ. Oh, there's so much there. Uh... That makes my mon- my mind run, Nate. Uh, first of all, you're talking about the Hampton Roads, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, a world that I have some familiarity with. And my dad was a Navy guy. He retired after 20 years when I was 12 years old. Uh, he spent his whole career in Seattle uh, at a naval, a- naval Air Station there. But just before he retired, they sent him to Norfolk. So I was there. I was actually baptized. I gave my heart to Jesus and was baptized on Granby Street, if you know that name, uh, at, on the corner of Bayview of and Granby. And anyway, so I have some familiarity with that. I also, you know, I'm old enough to be your father. Maybe you're, maybe I'm your grandfather, but I'm saying I know that my experience in school, it was then called Northside Middle School, right on Granby Street, uh, was very different from Seattle public schools in the way in which history was told. So immersed in the Hampton Roads, which is this collection of cities uh, at the convergence of Chesapeake Bay and the James River and the front of the Atlantic, uh, you know, there's Colonial Williamsburg, there's Jamestown, there's this, you know, kind of iconic American uh, portrait of of re- revolutionary days and colonial days and following days that we have idealized. And I found that when I went to school in public school in Norfolk, Virginia, the way in which things like the Civil War were spun was very different than what I was getting in yeah. Seattle and to which I returned. We went back to Seattle after that short stint, uh, you know, framing the, the conflict in terms of states' rights, not slavery. Uh, very distinctly yeah. remember my teacher, her name was Mrs. Chisholm, correcting me uh, if I veered into some other avenues. Now, I'm just bringing all that up to say, I, I'm, resi- I'm listening to you talk. Uh, I'm trying to th- imagine where Tidewater Gardens might be on the map. But in all of that, you have found yourself actually raised up in this crucible of history. And I'm hearing you say, discovering that there's so much more history than what was delivered to you in your home place, even though it was the stage upon which some of the defining work you've done took place, Nat Turner, the subject of your film, Birth of a Nation. Uh, I'm just acknowledging, Nate, that it's an astonishing story of of expanding Mm -hmm. horizons that it sounds like you didn't pursue so much, but you just kind of fell into. Is that fair? I mean, or, or what? a door opened, you, you left town and you found some new new ideas and then you said, I want to find out some more of those, or you just kind of stumbled into new telling of history. Yeah, I, it was it was a bit of, of, of a stumble, you know. Um, as I said, I never, you know, I, I wasn't a, a student of acting of the arts, of directing or uh, any of those things. Uh, I really was pursuing economics, you know, in a way that I could create a culture shift in my family. 
Uh, and it wasn't until I was looking to graduate and I was interviewing for a number of consulting jobs and uh, just jobs in the space. And uh, I said to myself, I'm not sure, you know, I'd, I'd done a little bit of an internship and just seeing the the trajectory of developers and programmers, it felt like a uh, it wasn't a culture fit for me. You know what I mean? For someone that was very expressive, um, that needed to be hands on. I couldn't imagine being kind of stuck in this world of a basement with earphones on coding all day. And so I was I remember very specifically pr- praying for God to like, you know, place me where he he thought I needed to be or where he knew I needed to be or give me some type of direction, some type of like uh, and, and let's be clear, you know, I wasn't the polished you know, Nate, back then I was still learning life. I was still, you know, looking to figure things out about my experience and what what my purpose was. Um, But I just knew that it wasn't to be, you know, a coder. And, um, you know, I ended up going to uh, an event with a friend who was there for, you know, modeling. And there was an acting teacher there. And he saw me and said, he thought I had a great look and gave me a a, a little booklet of, uh, on the program and had a a booklet of them. monologues and he asked me to read one i read it for him went well i got called back uh and then he said you must move to la and you must move now and uh and i remember calling my mother and i said um you know my mother is is my best friend and and has been my best friend for my whole life of course my wife and her would uh are are very close (laughs) in that race (laughs) um but my mother's is, is traditionally just she's been the closest to my heart and i remember calling her you know, a bit disappointed in myself that I was even considering this, you know, mom, I'm just I'm getting this remarkable degree, you know, out of school, I'll be able to make a ton of money. And I, and I, I feel like God's calling me to do something different and uh, I want to explore it. And then I waited to see her reaction. And I just remember she said, if, you know, if that's what the Lord is calling you to do, then, then that is what you should do. And she said, let's pray. Yeah. Here you are. And that was, and so then, yeah, here. So I, I remember within two two weeks later, I was packed up my car. I remember having a yard sale, selling everything. It was really just like moving by faith, you know, sold everything that wouldn't fit in the car. I got in the car and I was on the 40 to 40 to 10, 10 to Hollywood Way, where I lived in an Econo Lodge for, you know, a few weeks till I ran out of money and then slept on a couch. And, uh, and then, you know, I booked a national commercial, you know, not realizing that. <laughs> national commercials can be very lucrative you yeah. know so i was able to from one commercial get an apartment and kind of get my life stabilized and uh and that was my transition from tech and um is into being a creative and uh an and actor that was the that was my first step and i think because i had developed such a discipline around you know education and sports um because you know, to be an MSIS major and to be an athlete that that performed at a certain level was a, was very difficult. It re- required a, a very high level of, of sacrifice. So I, I I just remember thinking to myself, I can't let my mother down, who has supported me in this. So I'm going to apply everything I have into uh, this career, and that was kind of the starting point for me as an actor. That of course evolved into a number of other things. Do you remember what the product was that first commercial that? Of course. I, I don't know if I'll ever be as as famous as I was at home as when that commercial come out came out. It was a Tide commercial. And um, no, the first commercial was, a, was Sprint. And then I very quickly got another one called Tide. So Sprint, I mean, age myself. <laughs> Sprint like a cell the phone Sprint company. Commercial with, like, that was a cell phone company yeah, yeah. called Sprint. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so that's right? what you're talking about. Yep. Uh, now and T-Mobile. It was, there, there was a time, that's right. There was a time where Every minute of cell phone activity costs money unless yes, yes. it was after a certain time. This yes. was promoting seven o'clock when <laughs> calls became free. Anyone in the studio that is as old enough, you'll know what I'm talking about. Some of you younger people are like, hasn't it always been unlimited minutes? No. No. And so it was celebrating like seven o'clock, free minutes. Um, and so very quickly after, after that, I got a commercial for Tide with Febreze when they added Febreze to Tide. I can't believe I'm telling the story. It's so funny. <laughs> um, and I remember I did it and it was like, the commercial come on between every break, you know, during every break for this period of time on BT. And I remember going home and it was like 
it, you had thought I'd won an Academy Award. Like everyone was like, <laughs> mom, what smells so it's, good? Mom, what smells so good? It was like, because that was, was, that's your, you know, that's so, your script. Mom, what smells smell so good? That's mom, what smells so good? I remember it. I've had like, you know, older, you know, older ladies come up with like tears in their eyes. Like that commercial made me think about my son going to college and can I have a hug? It was like, <laughs> it was a, it was an interesting uh, moment and one I'll never forget, but that was the, that was the first sprint and tide really with a launch pad of my career. Well, so hey. thank you. You know, you, a little <laughs> plug for those companies. You used a phrase earlier in this uh, interview that I often use and actually, Nate, you're the first person I've ever met that used the phrase naturally, and that is the Lord doesn't waste anything. And uh, yeah. a commercial opportunity like that is not wasted. And it's way beyond what you might imagine in a minute. All right. So you, you've mm -hmm. talked about, uh, you, you stopped and prayed, and you, your mom said, we got to pray about this. I mean, that opens the door to, to Nate Parker, this uh, man who sees himself spiritually framed. And you also acknowledge, you know, maybe when you were praying about what to do as a career, you may not have been as polished as you are today. You may not be all together in the way you might be now. Uh, but tell me about that faith journey. It sounds like your mom was a woman of faith. Uh, you, you were exposed to uh, spiritual ideas and experience growing up. Uh, how did you buy in or how did that develop for you? Well, my grandmother's a preacher. Well, there's um, that. <laughs> she wasn't. Yeah, there's that. So she was very connected to the church. My mother was very connected to the church, and therefore I was very connected to the church. We lived in one of those households where for a very long time it was, you know, my grandmother, um, all of my my uh, uncles, uh, my aunt, and um, my sister. We all lived in one house in, in mm -hmm. Tywood Park. And, uh, you know, there were a few non-negotiables and one of those was church, you know, mm -hmm. Sunday we go to church and my, my mother sang with the church, my grandmother sang with the church. So uh, I cannot over communicate the importance of having a foundation um, that was, that, that, that was rooted in understanding um, just on a base level who Christ was and what, what his mission was and, and how we were to revere and, and seek relationship. Um, you know, and it goes back to something that I believe very deeply that, you know, the faith is not about perfection, but direction. Um, and, and, and at every turn of my life, I've been humble enough, regardless of where I was in my faith walk to, you know, get on my knees and kind of revert back to that, that, that spiritual place where my mother and grandmother, I remember, I mean, great grandmother, I remember praying over us, laying hands on us. They're, they're, you know, Baptist, Pentecostal, like there's always this, this desperation for the cross that I think really seated in me um, a, 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 an understanding that lasts, you know? Um, I think there were, you know, I've, I've been obviously exposed to many people of, that, that are in the faith and, and some in growing up so close to that kind of desperate, you know, connection to the Lord, it goes another way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I was, I, I was blessed to be in a household where, it was always, always uh, a foundational part of our big decision making, mm -hmm. you know. And and again, this is not about perfection. I have, you know, it's it's, you know, I I have an uncle that will drink and pray while he's drinking. You know what I mean? Like it's <laughs> yeah. it's it was yeah. never I was never pushed to be per perfect or never pushed to judge or be judged. It was just always this understanding of you know the Lord's will be done. You know, don't stress, be anxious about nothing. These are like. The word was really seated in my spirit. So as I got older and find, found myself at crossroads, found myself at challenges, um, I always knew well, you know, I know, I, know, I know who I belong to. And I know, as you said, nothing is wasted. So if I'm here, this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, if I'm at this crossroad, this is the will of the Lord. And I have to, you know, seek his face to figure out which way to go or how to handle it. And then that has been the navigate navigation system you know, for my life. And again, I, I, whenever I'm always, I mean, Jeremy Dixon, who, who, who called me and said, you know, you know, asked me if I would do this. He's one of my best friends in the world. And he knows that when it comes to talking about my faith, um, I'm very sure, but at the same time, I'm very humble because I'm very flawed. Mm -hmm. You know, I never want to come off specifically with the people that, that uh, have access to my platform as someone who is pious or just men, judgmental or uh, thinks he knows everything. 
Uh, for me, it's it's the Lord is 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 a, is not only a a fail safe, meaning I can't I can't fail, um, but but also you know the great navigator. You know, all I need to do is kind of hold on to Him, and 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 at times He will drag me in the direction I need to go. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah. to answer your question, it started very young with me when it came to just who Christ was and how important He was to our family, uh, and how I might. Um, hold on to the, you know, and they, they might embed the seeds that one day would grow, you know, and, and throughout college, there were times where I, that it was very necessary for me to have those seeds growing in my spirit to keep me. And there were times when I arrived to Hollywood and saw the roles that they were offering and, and knew that my grandmother would not um, <laughs> be in alignment with some of the things that they were offering me mm-hmm. and, and saying no, and there being difficulty around getting work because I was like, well, I'd rather not work than do this thing that I think not only denigrates my people, but is, you know, out of, out of alignment of, of, of my faith walk or where I think, you know, the Lord has kind of assigned me um, to go and, and to be effective um, in, 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 you know, in, 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 the, in the faith community. So it's a, it is, it is, it's a part of my life that I'm always, I'm, I'm very, I'm not sure about everything, but I'm very sure about that. I'm very sure about why I, why I'm here, my purpose and destiny uh, with respect to the faith. I think I'm hearing you say, Nate, that uh, you obviously grew up in a home and an environment where faith was a foundational platform, it was strong, it clothed your family, no matter what the other challenges might be, and that you have yeah. uh, carried that with you. And it's, of course, all of us grow up and we all develop. I, you know, back when I was 12 years old on Granby Street in Norfolk, Virginia, I remember uh, you know, d- making a decision, you know, I'm going to do this Jesus thing, because I grew up in a house like that, too, that uh, the church was yeah. central to our experience, and uh, uh, there was a lot of faith in my family. That said, at 12 years old, I I gave everything I knew how to give. <laughs> I'm doing this, I'm going to do it all in. But, you know, when you're 14 and you're 16 and you're 22, <laughs> at every stage of life, there's, there's a more, oh, there's some more stuff I should probably uh, surrender here. And, and as you have matured in your faith, as you've... Uh, grown were there any moments where you just thought no way this this whole thing is a made-up nonsense or has it always been kind of grounded in you and you just it just is i think there, there are two questions happening one is maybe have i ever been exhausted by the faith to the <laughs> to the point why i questioned um its design in, 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 in my life as someone who wanted to just live and not have to be browbeat with this understanding that this, I don't want to live in the box, <laughs> uh, you know, more. Uh, and then, then I think the other question is around, have I ever, maybe have I ever felt like, you know, the Lord's timing isn't good enough or this isn't working for me. I've tried and it's not working. So I want to go in another direction. Uh, thankfully it's, it's never been the latter. Um, you know, there were times I remember being in church <clears throat> and I, I, I would tell you this from, from the day I can remember going to church, maybe three till maybe 10 years old. I, I don't remember one sermon. Maybe, maybe I remember Jesus wept because every <laughs> once in a while in a black church, they'd be like, you know, they'll point at you and you have to say it. And I'll be like, Jesus wept. <laughs> That's the verse. Good? Okay. <laughs> So it was more of just kind of culture, you know, so I can remember being in church, being dressed in the suit, being hot, not wanting to be there, laying my head on my, like church, when you're a certain age, when you're from the South is about, you get dressed, you go to church and you go to sleep in your mom's lap until it's over. <laughs> and then you go and you eat after church with all the church folks. Yep. Like that was, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> there's some people that dance on the aisle and holler and sing and it's hot and they're fans, but it's not until you get older and you start living a little when you start recognizing that there, there's something deeper happening. Uh, there's something at play that, you know, when people say, well, how do you know that there's a God? How do you know there's a Christ? And I was like, listen, you know, I know because I've, I've felt the spirit. I felt it. You know I've what I mean? I've been it. in situations where, you know, and I was just telling a friend not too long ago, was it day before yesterday? You were talking about some tragedy that had happened and how it was impacting someone. And I said, you know, I cannot wrap my head around how people can navigate this life without Christ. You know, when I think about things that I've navigated as a, as a, as a young man, as a 
a grown up, you know, um, having five children, um, just all, it just thinking about what would my life be without having the secret sauce. You know what I mean? That yep. that <laughs> that is Christ, and and it's something that I'm glad I don't ever have to consider. You mentioned Jeremy mm -hmm. Dixon. Uh, Jeremy Dixon is the pastor of a, of a very dynamic congregation in L.A., in Inglewood, called Center of Hope, a uh, congregation of the Church of God, with which I'm also a part. And tell me a little bit about that. Uh, Jeremy is someone I also know well. How, how did you connect there? Well, it's, it's a miracle of a story. Um, I was first, I actually first met Jim's father, B Bishop D Dixon, mm -hmm. who's no longer with us here. Um, it's kind of a, it's it's a bit of a continuation of the story of of coming to Los Angeles. I remember, you know, like I said, it was it was it was shaky at first, and I finally got my footing. And in getting my apartment, it was now I was able to kind of branch out into the the city and see what it had to offer. I was taking classes, you know, I was you know I had an agent very early on, you know, uh, I had a an acting coach that stood in the gap for me. So it started to happen really quickly for me, um, but very quickly. I started to recognize kind of a, an emptiness in, in, in our city with, with respect to faith, you know, specifically my industry. Um, I, I guess I'd never been in an environment where it seemed faith was not even an ingredient uh, in, in most people's lives to, to existing, not alone, let alone, you know, success. And, uh, and that pull into the industry, that kind of emptiness, that invisibility, uh, that I, that so many young people that come to this town town struggle with, I, I begin to feel right away. Uh, and I remember uh, I was at I was at a party or something, and it's an interesting story. I, I was at a party somewhere in the hills. I go with someone, and there was this kind of they had these like tables, but the tables were coming out of the ceiling. It was like really cool architecture. I remember leaning on the uh, on one of these things, and actually, remember I was kind of like just on my own, trying to trying to find my way, like a lot a, a lot of folks do. And uh, and I was sitting there, and I was hanging out, and I walked I walked away, and someone was looking behind me. They say, "You see that?" And I looked, and these things coming out of the ceilings were upside down crosses. And I remember, like it just kind of hitting me, like, "Oh God!" Like, you know, you you hear about um kind of demonic activity or the or, or how you know how satan shows up in spaces where he's invited you know where the lord is not invited where the lord is stuck at the door type type feel and but you never see them manifest themselves in such a physical way it's usually the undercurrent a feeling like oh i don't want to be here but it was just so clear. And I remember this cross upside down and this kind of glow. They had these red lights. Uh, and I can just remember fleeing, like, oh, I got to get out of here. And I left. And I remember being home being like, you know what? I need to, I need to go to church. And it was like 2.30 in the morning. It was Saturday night. I was like, I got to go to church. And then my then that voice in my mind was like, it's 2.30. Just go next week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what do you do? 2.30, what? Church is going to start in what, four hours, five hours you're going to be... And I remember telling myself, okay, if I wake up in time, I'll go. I'll go find somewhere. Um, but if I sleep in, I'll wait till next week or wait to another time. And I remember I went to sleep. It was probably like 3 o'clock. Woke up at 6.15 as if I'd slept 15 hours. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. You know, it was like this mental inside my head conversation with myself around direction. You know what I mean? Those seeds that have been set in me were literally guiding me somewhere. And it was really a question of in every step, if I was going to, how I was going to respond. And I remember saying, okay, fine, I'll get in the car. So I get in the car and I was like, I wish I had some gospel music. This is before you could connect your phone that had access to the yeah, world yeah, into yeah. your, we yeah. had CD play. And I didn't have any CDs that were gospel CDs, but I did have Marvin Gaye's His Eyes on the Sparrow. So I plugged it in, you know, put the, the, the CD in and I started to drive. And as you can imagine, the second it comes on, I start crying. I'm like weeping, like sobbing. And I'm driving down the um, 101, just sobbing, looking for signs of a church. And I just kept driving. I drove. I ended up on like the 170, or, you know, like I end up on the 405. I was just driving, driving, driving. And it's funny because I saw a steeple past 
But then I realized I was too far along to exit to be able to go to that one. So I let it pass. I find myself on the 105, true story. And I see a sign that said Crenshaw. And I said to myself, Crenshaw, there has to be a black church close by. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's there a has famous to be street something. in the, it, yeah, the street itself. Famous, right? Yeah, I was yeah. like, Crenshaw is like, I've heard of Crenshaw. Like any, you don't have to come to LA to, to have heard of it. And I was like, you know, so I exit. And when I pull up to the exit, tears and snot, I pull up next to a car. And in that car, there are two black women with these huge <laughs> church hats. And I mean, the kind that have like fruit baskets or bird nests, like huge <laughs> touching the top of the car. And, uh, and I, and I, and I roll my window down and I wave to the woman, the woman rolled her window down about this much. And she said, exactly. She was like, what you want? I mean, I look crazy. You know, I'm in a beat up car because everyone gets to LA before you really start working as a terribly beat up car crying. And I said, I'm, I, I need to go to church. Are you, are you ladies, ma'am? Are you going to church? She said, we going to church. Follow us, follow her all the way up Crenshaw to Hardy park crying. I can feel the emotion come right now, but I'm going to beat it back. And I get out. Her name was Mrs. Love. And she guided me, like literally by my shoulders, walk with me into the church. They were singing. The, um, Bishop Dixon was there and he was leading like praise and worship. And I walked in and I laid on the altar, like right there. Um, <sighs> I just kind of went back to that to that, well, that place. It was that. It I'm was, almost there with you. And I didn't see it. it yeah, it's so powerful. Sometimes you it. Yeah, but sometimes it takes walking into a place, arriving, and then it hit it hit hitting you. That as we said, God wastes nothing. Everything was designed for that moment to get me to that place of surrender. So I remember laying on the altar for the rest of the service. You know and. I laid there and I came up, I listened and Bishop Dixon never told me to move. He never got anyone to whisk me away. He just let me just kind of sit there. And then after church, he came over and the people came over, they prayed for me. And, and then he's, you know, he basically said, uh, you know, asked me some questions about where I'd come from. I told him I'd got there and he just said, you're okay. You're safe. And um, that was 19 years ago, 20 years ago that that happened. So I kind of stumbled into uh, First Church of God. It was called Center of Hope. Bishop Dixon, you know, took me under his wing, became like a mentor to me. And he had a son that was not in the ministry that was 23 at the time, just like 22 at the time, just like me. Um, I think I'm older than Jeremy by like six months or something. Uh, and, you know, and that's how I met Jeremy. But I didn't, you know, Jeremy was kind of like doing his own thing. He grew up in LA and we met and he was a really great guy. But, you know, Bishop Dixon would, would, he just took it upon himself to really um, guide me in that moment and that kind of desperation, that, that, that feeling of being lost in this big city um, and being at a crossroads about who I, who I would become in this industry with or without the faith. And, uh, and so every Sunday I drive from North Hollywood to first church of God. You know, which is pretty far. If you know, if you know yeah, yeah, the ways. town, it's maybe maybe twenty five miles. And so I'd spend time spend time there. You know, and and then and very shortly after that, I a couple things happened. Uh, my, I've known my wife since nineteen ninety nine. We met in January nineteen ninety nine, and we broke up for a short period of time. Right, you know, before I graduated, and so and it was like the Lord told me, like it's time to 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 pull her back into your life. I called her. We started, you know, you know, talking on the phone. And I said, I think, you know, I, 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 I think it's, it's time, you know, I think it's time for us to be together again. She was like, well, I don't want a boyfriend, you know, so. <laughs> and uh, and so I ended up going and and uh, ended proposing to her and the rest is history. But that that was so my relationship with Jeremy, um, who was in a very similar place, you know, being called to do something. But, you know, he I remembered one of the first things he told me when we started hanging out. And he was like, I'm not going to be a preacher. You know, that is not my Anything future. But that. <laughs> you know, a lot of things I want to do in life. The last thing I'm doing is going to be a preacher. I will not be. A, it, he was so sure. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he he moved into the ministry, went to Atlanta. And by now we're very, very, very close. And then, you know, his Bishop Dixon, you know, bless him. He passed away. And um, and Jeremy answered the call. And uh, and not only 
in that moment, watching that transition in his life, it had such an impact on my life because I saw how someone who was cool and young and full of energy and full of opportunities gave it, gave all of that to his faith and to the cross and to the service, um, you know, uh, of, 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 you know, progressing the Lord's work. And that's a big thing because, you know, I, I, I tell Jer Jeremy a lot and I'll say it here. You know, I'm not a fan of, you know, hospice churches where just old people go to die and go to heaven. You know what I mean? Like, I I, I don't think our Lord is a Lord of, of hospice. I think he is, a, you know, a, a Lord of, of, of action and revolution um, and in standing in the gap, you know, as Nat turned it as Jesus did and in, in, in so many others. So I've been able to watch his path and, 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 and remain close to him and in, in the way in which he leads the church. And, you know, I told him, I said it. There's nothing you can ask me that I won't do. So be careful with that. So when he reached out and said, you know, I'd love to introduce you to, um, you know, our, our an extension of our church and, and this interview, it was a no brainer. But yeah, Jeremy is one of my best best friends in the world. And I think I think he is uh, in many ways a prophet. I think he is as remarkable a, a teacher and educator as I've ever met. I mean, he is someone who has our congregation in the high schools, the local high schools, like he, he, his church is very much alive. Yeah. And that's why I travel so much. And no matter where I am, I'll always stay connected to it. Well, I, I'll cooperate your testimony about Jeremy Dixon. He is, uh, I would use the hashtag none finer. There's just nobody uh, that is more together mm -hmm. for Jesus than Jeremy Dixon. But uh, that's right. Thanks for, Thanks for unpacking a little bit of that, and it all makes so much sense. And it's it's honestly such an inspiring story of a person uh, who is finding his way, and how God is, in fact, intervening in your life. I mean, <laughs> story of the two gals on the way to church. I mean, come on, you have to know there is a God who pulled you <laughs> over and brought you there of all places, and how that has borne fruit. And as you as you talk about Jesus and Nat Turner. Let's talk about Nat mm -hmm. Turner. That's this. Nat Turner is a subject of a film that uh, you named "Birth of a Nation." Now that title itself is loaded with baggage uh, because that's the name of a pioneer motion picture that uh, today is viewed with, what shall we say, disdain by uh, most people who have eyes to see and ears to hear because it is so prejudicial. It's so kind of. Uh, representing a, a world deformed. And yet at the time when it was introduced mm -hmm. in 1915, it was a breakthrough, I mean, of technology, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the art and craft of making a motion picture. I mean, it had many things that pushed it right to the front of the, uh, the mm -hmm. queue. Uh, the first film ever uh, viewed in the White House is Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. In 1915. But it has much controversy because yeah. of the way in which it portrayed uh, the development of the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, some people would say it inspired the Klan's second act uh, in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, and for all those reasons, it's got a lot of shade about it. And here you chose that same title for this historic narrative of Nat Turner, a very dramatic, compelling film. We've already heard that you, you kind of discovered Nat Turner, who was actually resident in your world in, in the same geography as you were when he was a young man, but didn't mm -hmm. discover until you moved away. Then you became gripped by his story. And Birth of a Nation tells mm -hmm. that story. And it is an interesting weave in a way that we don't often see of, of faith, of, of the spiritual realities and the material world about justice and injustice. I I'm going on, this is an interview with you, Nate, but I have to say, I think of it uh, kind of in a parallel with the, the film Harriet, which is about Harriet Tubman, another uh, compelling figure from a similar age. But Harriet's trajectory is different than Nat Turner's. Her, her life ends quite differently than Nat Turner's does. Uh, the film Harriet uh, grabbed me, uh, just, uh, and just the way I was drawn into the story. Birth of a Nation, can can take you into deep, deep emotional distress. Tell me about mm -hmm. it now, with all that set up. <laughs> oh, you want to make this movie. No, you want to no. tell the story of Nat Turner, and and it does tell the story. How does that come together? Well, I think 
as D.W. Griffith proved that filmmaking, the moving picture, as it has been called by propagandists, is the most effective tool in shifting and shaping hearts and minds that we have. And Griffith is the um, person who produced the first Birth of a Nation, for those who might not know. That guy, he understood the power of the medium. 100%. And he understood the necessity of white supremacy. And I think that it's important that we never separate those two when it comes to, in the same way that it is dangerous to only talk about Christ and never talk about Satan. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's very, very important that we recognize that there is an actual battle. It isn't come to Christ or just be regular. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it is binary, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the same way, when it comes to what Griffith and to a certain extent, Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was the president that invited him to the White House and, and said it, it was asked if it had been written in lightning, um, what they understood about what was needed for their agendas in this country to create a mechanism of, uh, of oppression and subjugation that would last forever. We're still here, right? Yeah. Um, you know, as I, as I told you, I went to school as a programmer. So I studied, you know, Visual Basic and C++ and Cobalt and all these different programming languages. Um, and I found it very interesting that the Lord would guide me into that profession to get an understanding of how ideas, thoughts, mentalities are literally written on our spirit. And then we act out the behaviors of that program in the same way that mm -hmm. a program would. Mm -hmm. And so approaching filmmaking from the standpoint of, if it is true that we are from a, you know, um, a psychological standpoint, uh, a, a written program, a collection of experiences and circumstances that motivate our behaviors, then I would use this medium to reprogram, to cross out the bad code and to write over that code with good code or mm -hmm. transformative code okay. yep. that can not only change individuals, but could really change culture. So reclaiming that title was something that I knew would come with consequences. Um, however, it was necessary with respect to long-term reprogramming. Just the simple fact that mm -hmm. when you Google the birth of a nation, there is an alternative. That's right. There's an answer. Mm -hmm. There's a different definition now. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a different, it, it is, it is more complicated as the history of this country has been remarkably, you know, you got to imagine as a black man, the, the daily decision you make when you step out of bed as to how American are you in a nation that even to this moment has refused to properly address the dysfunction. You said, you know, you said a, a great word earlier, the, the deformed state of a nation. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the birth of this nation? How was this nation born? You know, we talk about history. You know, there are a few history books written by the indigenous None that I've read. <laughs> yes, right. You know, uh, and very few that have, have 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 reached critical mass, right? But I imagine that if we could read, if the books were written by the indigenous, they could be a third film entitled "The Birth of a Nation." Uh, that would be very different, even than, than my own, but just as important. You know, um, I'm I'm one of those people where I don't think that we can make responsible decisions without dealing with the irresponsibilities of our nations. Uh, uh, beginnings. And so this film was just one thread of that rope, you know, of saying there'll be many people um, that have already had done many works around righting the wrongs of the nation. Um, and this is, I mean, there's so many people I could name, but this is just hopefully something that can live uh, within that lexicon and saying the original birth of a nation is, is drenched in blood. And this is my effort to retrieve it, um, the actual narrative, and kind of, um, you know, soak it in, 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 in a, tr a truth, you know, mm -hmm. and, and hope that the programming would impact everyone, because white supremacy in America is not a black people problem, you know, it, it just isn't. Yeah. It yeah. is one, it, 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 one, it's sin, 
racism, white supremacy, but two, it's a, it's an American, it's a problem that impacts everyone. So making that film, I, I, I started from that space, reclaim it, clean it, repurpose it, present it, and do it not from a standpoint of trauma, but from a, a standpoint of liberation. You know, the Lord's, you know, Jesus Christ, his mission was liberation. He liberated us. He was a revolutionary. He came and he died. And I made that that film in some ways in the image uh, or to pay homage to that. And I and I made it with a with a brave heart slant mm -hmm. because I, I don't believe, you know, um, you know, Dr. King said power can seize nothing without a demand. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've always believed a, a demand is empty without an or else. And I think Nat Turner took that that next step that said or else. Uh, and guess who else did? The United States of America in 1776. You know, I mean, the reality is that we have so many different examples of this. It's only controversial when it makes people or because it makes people so uncomfortable. It causes internal conflict, con conflict. It challenges cognitive dissonance and it puts people in a crossroads. When people say I'm a Christian, I say, OK, that's great. Well, what kind of Christian are you? You know, are you a Christian like Nat Turner was a Christian? Or are you a Christian like those who you know, hanged him, skinned him, and crushed his flesh into grease. You know, I think we're called to to choose sides when it comes to the faith. And that was my representation of what it meant to truly stand in, in the gap, to truly, you know, uh, call on the Lord and listen, um, and, 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 and to suffer the greatest, you know, sacrifice. The original Birth of a Nation, or the first film with that name, was altogether fiction in the sense that it, it tells the story of two families, one from the North, one from the South, and how they intersect over time in the pre-Civil War days and following and so on. And, and of course, the, the, the challenge with this film, as you describe white supremacy, is it, it, it magnifies and exalts this kind of lost cause uh, theology that the poor Confederates had this idyllic world and we need to protect that even though the war is lost and this is where the Klan comes in to protect the status quo or the, the, the place of white folk uh, in their home places and to preserve a lot of things. I mean, there's, there's just all kinds of reality in Can a I fictional add, story. I'm going yeah. to interject yeah. because yeah. it's very important that we not forget the device they use. And that was the purity of white women. That was the device. That was the story. If that film only, yeah, that, that was the device, the tool. That was the hammer. It was everything else was place, was place setting or, or, or set design or production design. Because as, at its core, that was the, that was the, the device used to sway, persuade, and inspire the type of cognitive dissonance that would have people leave the theater and lynch the first black man they saw. Because this happened. Because it, it, it posited a threat, a threat to white women and their purity in, in any kind of change up in the social construct. Uh, if if black men were to be able to advance or to move about and so on and so forth, and I mean, oh, there's so much there. I don't I don't want to to tell the story, except it's so interesting to me because I honestly hearing you talk about reprogramming, taking that phrase "birth of a nation" and actually making a film that is not fiction. It's actually based in a true mm -hmm. story of a real person. Nat Turner is not a Charles Dickens character. He's a real person who lived right. a real life, which makes the narrative even maybe more compelling because when you're portraying him and you are the actor who portrays him on film, I mean, this is this is a master work from Nate Parker. I know there are other places and other persons have their heads on it, but you help write the screenplay. You write the book. You help form the narrative. You direct the film and you are the the actor of the leading character. And all of that, uh, it is reprogramming. I, I, I think about my own uh, laptop I have here. You know, when you delete something, what you're really doing is you're burying it until something else overwrites it. And, and it has to be overwritten. I mean, that's the idea, isn't it? And your whole concept of, of reprogramming is so compelling, Nate, wow. And so as you tell the story, uh, just unpack for the person who has not seen the film or doesn't know about Nat Turner. Just give me a precy of what's his story. Yeah, so so Nat Turner was uh, an enslaved 
man who as a child was taught to read. Uh, and that was the his first weapon toward injustice, whether he knew it or not. And in learning to read, because he was only allowed to read the Bible, he became completely consumed with the word. And this is the uh, early and, 19th and, century, early 1800s. Um, this was in the early 1800s. And so he was in a situation where now that he could read and he knew the Bible inside and out, and I think it's a great footnote to recognize that all the answers to all of our problems you can dig, you, you can dig uh, those out there. Yep. Yeah, right. So to to for that to be the only thing you can read, to be denied that right of education, um, it was a perfect storm in creating a revolutionary. Um, I think it's no mistake that, you know, the the laws that existed to oppress people during that time were predicated on keeping them away from the intelligence, mm -hmm. from the academia that could allow them to think a certain way. You know, Carter G. Woodson has a quote that says, when you can control a person's actions, you, I mean, control a person's mind, you don't have to worry about their actions. You can, you know, you don't have to tell them to go to back door. They'll go on their own. And if there is no back door, they'll cut one out for their pleasure. You know, that's Carter G. Woodson. It's one of the, one of the most impactful. And so when you think about, you know, slavery and people are like, why didn't they fight? Why didn't they run? The reality is, is when your mind is under control. And so that was the first key he had to unlock his potential and to gain the type of fellowship with Christ that would allow him to make decisions in the spirit, right? Like that to me was like, you know, and to play that character, you know, as, as method goes, you have to become very close to what it means to be a pastor who was consumed with the word. So I had to become consumed with the word. And it's the closest I've ever been to God in my life by a mile. Um, and I just remember writing and crying and crying and writing and praying um, that somehow I could create something that would be a like a North Star for people who were oppressed, for people who had been denied their personhood, denied their the 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 true representation of of, of Christ in their faith, uh, and that and inspire revolutionary spirit. You know, Nat Turner prayed for a sign from Christ and got a solar eclipse. Like that was a miracle, if you believe in such things, and I do. Yeah. He prayed, "Give me a sign, Lord," because. What I'm gonna have to do right now, I know how it's gonna end. Is this what you want me to do? Solar eclipse, you know? So I wouldn't have, and I say it often, I wouldn't have been interested in writing a story about a revenge fantasy. It was important that injustice lived at, at every corner and every moment that was pervasive within the air, his, air he breathed. And not that he was just wanted to revenge, but he said, if, if, if Christ is who he says he is, and this word is, this spirit that I'm feeling is true, then I, I have to act. And I think that that's a message for me, you know, in the way that I've chosen every project, especially since then. And I think it can be made applicable to everything. So in, in making this story, it was very much a spiritual journey for me in more ways than I can explain. Um, and, it, and, and more than a movie, I just wanted to, to create something, as I said during the time, that would inspire people to have a riotous disposition. You know, the, the, those, biblically speaking, the people that rolled with Christ, they were unshakable and they were about action. They didn't stay in one place every Sunday and talk to each other. They went to the places in which they were they, they were there was danger. And uh, and then when, you know, obviously when, when when our Lord was 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 crucified, they continued the work in prison to their death. You know, when you read the book of Revelation, you know, there are people literally beneath, beneath the throne crying out like how long lord you know like that that is the type of you know christ-led revolutionary that i want to be in my work and i strive to be like in real life and again I, I always preface that by saying in no way am i perfect i'm a flawed man every day i mean what time is it you know what i mean that, that you know um but that was my approach that if nothing else people left saying this was a man that gave us his life in 
everything he was to, to Christ and sacrifice everything on behalf of what he truly believed his purpose and his destiny was and gladly walk to Christ. You know, that's biblical. If I'm dying <laughs> on behalf of the Lord, then let's go. Let's do that. And, and Nat Turner, as you've described him, was a person born in slavery who did become literate, who did discover the scripture that opened up his mind. Yeah. When you described him as a pastor, he still was a slave as a pastor. I mean, he was mm -hmm. not set free to be a pastor. <laughs> he, he was living within mm -hmm. human bondage. And in his... I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a yeah. quick correct correction yeah. before okay. you go. He was enslaved. He was enslaved. He wasn't a slave. He was enslaved. And I think okay. that there's a okay. distinction worth making. Yes, tell um, me. You know, he, he was free, but he was enslaved. Free gotcha. as a human, free as yeah, a man yeah. of, of Christ, uh, but he was enslaved. And I think that there's a difference with respect to what I said before about, you know, the, the psychological perspective. You know, yeah. there was no ownership of his mind, specifically he, when he, you know. He was um, physically. But, but continue, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 that's such a really valid observation. He was physically constrained, but his persona right. was free. And mm -hmm. in that freedom, he pursued to his death what he understood to be the calling of Christ on his life. And so in the, in the history, Nat Turner is, is famous because he led an uprising. Mm -hmm of slaves, mm -hmm. of people who were enslaved, to say, stop it, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not right. Mm -hmm. And and it's not that he was prone to violence, it's just that every other every other voice was, mm -hmm. they, well, there were deaf ears. And so he finds himself right. in a rebellion, an armed rebellion, uh, which ultimately takes his own life. How does that life end? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, he was. Uh, you mean physically? The actual. Yeah, I mean, yeah. How he was. He was lynched. Uh, he was beaten on his way to being uh, hanged by his neck, uh, and then he was decapitated. He was skinned, and uh, he was defleshed, and his flesh was uh, melted into grease. There's actually uh, in my research. I know this to be true. In my when I went to Cortland in the area in which the, uh, he lived, and this rebellion happened. Um, there still is a wallet made of his flesh, and there is a, a lamp that is made of his flesh. And the actual sword he used in rebellion is being held by a white man that is in city council. Uh, and so I learned all this in my in my in my research. Uh, but yeah, we actually found his so his body was displaced in a way that he'd never had proper burial. And during the birth of a nation. I was able to work with a doctor out of um, Virginia named Kelly Dietz in National Geographic, and we were able to locate his skull that was being held literally on a bookshelf in, uh, from a professor in, in, in a school in Indiana, I want to say. And we were able to convince him to give the, the skull, which was carved with the doctor's name that mm. sliced open the top. It was, mm. uh, and it was returned to his family, and they were able to give him a proper burial all these years later. So. You know, it was uh, that's that was the fate of his flesh, uh, but the 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 ascension of his spirit, yeah, uh, well. was worth it. You know, because here we are. This is what uh, uh, someone who is a film critic, his name is Julie Justin Chang. He wrote in Variety when the film came out, a biographical drama steeped equally in grace and horror. It builds to a brutal finale that will stir deep emotion and inevitable unease. Mm -hmm. Are you pleased with that summary? Praise God. Because, Praise it's, God. because that because accurately captures it. If it. Yes, if it doesn't cause unease, then I'm not sure it is true sacrifice. You know, I think service is made of very difficult stuff at times. What does it mean to serve? You know, and sometimes service is conflated with success and decisions are made that are not in service to those who need a story, who need that liberation or who need that perspective. So, you know, I try to make films that lock people in their seat long past the credits. If I'm remembered for anything, I want people to, to know that when you went to a film that was directed by this man, you couldn't just go out to eat after and forget 
mm-hmm. that it was something that stayed with you and challenged your thinking and hopefully inspired you to in some way join the fight. So I think that that is a, that is a, a fair summary and one that, that is a very pointed as to what my intentions were. There are many ways to evaluate a film. Uh, it is art. Uh, there's content, of course. There's storyline, there's narrative, there's progression of thought, and just as you've described, impact. There's also the, the technique of filmmaking, uh, just like an oil painting. Uh, are, we, are we in an Impressionist era or a Renaissance era and so on? And, and your, your craft uh, is displayed in, in many, many different dimensions in this film because the way in which the camera moves the way in which the actors uh, inter- intervene with each other, just the, the backstory, the, the narrative, and of course the content is so compelling. I mean, Nate, this film has become a marker. Uh, and it, mm. it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in, in uh, 2016. Mm. Sundance, of course, is a, is a kind of premier alternative venue for filmmakers, especially independent film. You, you had to go out and raise money for this and so on, and you, you bring it to Sundance. And, and the crowd, if I could describe it this way, I wasn't present, I've just read about it, but I mean, the crowd kind of just goes wild, or, or, or they're, maybe wild isn't the word. They're impossibly moved so that the film receives awards and Fox Searchlight pays at the time a record price to pick this this work up and distribute it. And as you look back on that and and I've listened to your heart and your passion, uh, that's not the end of the story for you. In other words, this is not this is not the uh, Sistine Chapel, and you're just not going to paint anymore. Uh, you still have mm-hmm. things to do. You have other projects that you have done. I just have to also ask you about The Great Debater, this story mm-hmm. uh, uh, which has actually produced not just a film, but has produced now an ongoing investment in young lives. Tell me about that. Mm-hmm. This is the story of a young man who, against impossible odds, uh, finds himself prevailing in a world of debate, a formal debate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and that film changed my life. That was the first film that I won the role and I needed to win the role because I'd said no to so many things that my my agents were quite frustrated with me. I said, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. That is not a representation of what, you know, that is not something that I would be proud to, you know, part of my legacy. And after a while, you're like, well, then what, what am I going to do? And, you know, in saying no to all of the things that I felt were not progressive for my faith, for my specifically for my culture, my people. When something did come along, as you can imagine, the whole world is fighting to get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember my mother came to visit me, um, and she moved out to LA not too much longer after. But she, you know, she gave me the the you know Second Corinthians, you know, ten three through six or something. You know, it's um, be anxious about nothing, but in all things. Mm-hmm. and making my request known to Christ was always something I would do like, okay, Lord, I don't know about if this audition is the audition, but yeah, protect my heart because, you know, I want it. I, I, I think it's for me, uh, but your will be done. Protect my heart if it's not, but give me everything I need to perform. And I was able to, you know, audition, uh, you know, for um, the casting director. And then I heard that Denzel would watch the tape and liked it. I came back, I auditioned for him. Uh, and essentially, there was a process in which he hired me in the room. And um, it was life changing because in the same way with Nat Turner, I had to like literally become like a preacher with respect to my approach. With this, I had to become a brilliant mind in all things literature, art, academia of the ta- time. And it was very difficult because debaters aren't good just because they're persuasive. They're good because their brains are so full, so active, and so high level that they can call upon things mm-hmm. much more quickly than mm-hmm. any of the competition. So I said to get there, and he put us into debate camp. I just had to consume everything, and I don't mean just, you know, uh, County Cullen, but W. B. Yeats at cross color lines. I had to consume everything, you know, bought those quotations. and um, it was exhausting. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. But that's when it hit me. You know, 
the reality of that. I'd come from Tidewater Park and now I was being positioned from a standpoint of education and academia and catching up that I felt as though, wow, if I could have, if I could come from where I came from, then obviously there's no lack of capacity within our communities. It's not, it's just not being cultivated. And, and it elevated me. It, it, it actually raised something in my mind with respect to what that film could mean to young sisters and brothers who were not being cultivated, that they could see someone that was seen as street, that had a mind that far exceeded those who were privileged enough to be cultivated for that space that they were occupying. So this was a street guy. Henry Lowe was a street guy, a thug as some in this social climate would call him. Yet his brain worked faster than those of his opponents at USC, Harvard, yes. whichever. Um, and so I dove into it with everything that I had. Uh, and it was a film that changed my life because that was the film that really uh, facilitated me, not only falling in love with my people, but recognizing that I could really gain the tools to create the type of media and stories that could be additive to our progression forward and add on the work that has been done by our ancestors uh, that sacrificed their lives in so many different ways that 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 academia and education and a sharp mind and debate and persuasion could be my could be the tools that I used for revolution. Whereas Nat Turner had garden tools, you know, and broken muskets or whatever they could get their hands on. I could give to the world a, 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 a piece of material, a piece of content that would inspire them to use words and to use things, to use social media platforms. Um, and again, I'm not the end all. I'm not solving any problems. I'm not here to save black people, but to contribute just something, just a glimmer of something that could be helpful in that journey. You know, it was during that, that film that it became clear to me that that, that added directional uh, North Star became much more refined about where I wanted to go. And, uh, and you know, obviously wow. I got to work with Denzel Washington and- Well, there's that guy. Uh, that was, <laughs> yeah, there's 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 that. Uh, and Forrest Whitaker and, um, you know, and Kimberly Elise, like they, these, these are just some of the most extraordinary people, you know, uh, on earth, just being able to work with them and have them wrap their arms around me and, recognize my desperation to do right by our people and then support me even after the film. It was very important. It was very, it was very uh, important to me. So, yeah, so that, that film, that film was one of, one of the trigger points or one of the, the major um, boosts in my, in my, in my, uh, my jetpack, so, so, so to speak. How, what chunk of time would a film like that, require from you. You described going to debate camp. You described immersion in the character. You described working with some of Hollywood's greatest names and the whole production. What what kind of timeline is that? Is that five months, two months, two years? What would you say? Yeah, I think it was pre-production was maybe like, I don't know, maybe two months, maybe a little less. But I think the work for me, I started prepping. This is this goes back to faith, right? I felt I felt when I so uh, a manager got me the script in 2004, right as I was doing a film called Pride with Terrence Howard and Bernie Mac and Kimberly Lee, is that one, uh, around, um, you know, the most successful black swim team. It's a swim America team movie, about. Pride, another inspiring tale okay but right after that you get this yes about our capacity and about cultivation but i got the script and he said um this is a film that denzel Washington and oprah are going to produce together if you want to take a look and i read it and i start studying it immediately so by the time it came time to read for it i had the whole script memorized L literally every page everyone's dialogue mm -hmm. i'd been so consumed if i wouldn't have got that job i don't know what what, what i would have done <laughs> but the work I think when you understand the stakes, the work becomes such a, a critical ne necessity to your life. It's like, I have to get this right because on the other end of that, you know, presentation, on the other end of the camera, other end of the screen, the audience, 
will either take from it what they need or I will fail them and they won't catch it. So I take that very seriously. And I think there are a number of actors that have a similar approach. Um, so many, 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 many hours, you know, when it comes to memorizing a hundred pages of material, it's like a Broadway play, yeah. you know, um, I never want to find myself in a situation where I was not prepared to do the thing that called the, the Lord called mm-hmm. me to do. Yep. Uh, and so the, 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 the time it takes is just another part of it, you know, hours. I don't, you know, it's the equivalent of an 80 hour week. You know what I mean? Where you're constantly, I re- so man, I wrote a hundred page backstory, which I still have. I should have pulled it out for you um, by hand as a biography of Henry Lowe. I gave it to Denzel Washington. When I met him, I said, uh, because I heard that he required a biography of a character. I gave it to him and he looked at it and he flipped through it and he looked at me. And then he said, he gave it back and he says, hold on to that. You're going to need it. <laughs> and, uh, that's how I knew the job. <laughs> you knew that you were um, on, yeah. yeah. But how many, so when is the film done from the time you hear about it to the time okay. it's over? Yeah. How long a time is that? So when you, so I got the script in 2004, I believe was studying it. The audition didn't come to 2006. Maybe oh. we shot no 2000 in early 2006. If I could recall, yeah. we start shooting in the summer of 2000. Um, Jeez, 2000, 2006, and it came out 2007, I think. Yeah, Maybe so Christmas I mean, there's a long, during- that's a long haul in, a long, for a, yeah, for a single a long, project. But yes. typically, yeah. typically, it goes like this. As a director, I just kind of give you the rundown. Typically, you, as a director, when you can get a script off the ground, when you get a green, you, to green light a script, once you get the money, you set a date. It's like, all right, we're going to go and we're going to go into pre, pre-production in two months. Pre-production, depending on your budget, and I've all, and because I make stories about, you know, positive stories about our progress. I, I never have enough money, but let's just say you have a, you know, like $5 million, $8 million budget. You, it, you're probably going to get, you know, if you're lucky, two months of prep and uh, which goes faster than you think. Mm-hmm. And then you'll shoot for, you know, my but my schedules have always been like 24 days you know oh, so which is turn it insane. around fast yeah you it's unreal uh and then you go into post and then you have to just okay. finish the movie the editing the sound there's so many things that go into making a movie it's really all all in all if i put bookends on it, it's like a anywhere from a 12 to an 18 month process mm-hmm. it can be as long as 18 months it can be as quick as if you're trying to get it out for a deadline i don't know 10 yeah. months 11 yeah. months very difficult yeah. As an actor, you you assume the role. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've described in both of these two films and you had more, uh, so mm-hmm. much investment in assumption of the persona. Would you consider a role mm-hmm. in a film that you felt provoked positive change and revolution, let's say, but where your character was a dark or a negative one as opposed to a heroic yeah. figure? Yeah, I mean, you could. You, yeah, well, you feel dark, like you could get into character yeah, to do and, that. Well, dark and negative is relative, right? There okay. are people that we celebrate that are Complex. dark. You know what I mean? <laughs> that 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 you, you know what I mean? Like, I think you know the question becomes what's good and bad. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think that I try not to judge anything or anyone. I'm as I am as flawed a human being as has ever been born. Uh, but I ask myself, you know, we take everything to prayer. I really trust my wife when it comes to pick, picking roles as well. Sometimes I go to her and be like, so this is the character and I'm thinking. She was like, okay, well, is that in alignment with what you said you want to do? Yeah. You know, because sometimes you'd be like, so they're going to pay me this to do that. She's like, okay, okay. Is that an alignment? With, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it, I often give to young people the analogy of the, uh, the GPS, you know, and I'll say, you know, when you, when you put a, an address into a GPS and you push go, you know your destination and the program will get you there. If you take a wrong turn, what does it do? Mm-hmm. It course corrects, it gets you back on track. But knowing where you're going, why you're going there, what's going to happen when you get there, those type of things, um, those are the things that kind of drive decision making for me. Is it on purpose? Does it feel like it's within my destiny? I prayed about it. How do I feel? And Sometimes that's playing. I, I've played roles that that had a, a darkness to them that that 
were for the good. Some people would say net turnover is yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, you know, I yeah. never shy away from the fact that you you know net turn killed everyone, men, women, and children, right? Um, which I defend as biblical. You know, like I'm not as not that I'm the person to defend Nat Turner. He answers to Christ, but this idea that what is good and bad. You know, um, I think the destination determines those things. So would I play? I play just about any type of role if I felt like it was guiding us toward a, an explicit net positive with respect to my values. I, I, of course, I have no experience on stage in the way you do. I, I'm, 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 this is a preposterous thing I'm even going mm-hmm. to say here. But in, in my years as a pastor, I pastored for many years. Uh, our church did a production of Dickens, A Christmas Carol Every Christmas. I mean, it, it became a thing in our town for our place. It was a production. And I remember I, in each year, I'd be cast as something or another. And sometimes the ghost of Christmas past or the ghost of Jacob Marley or, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge, who is, of course, the, the redeemed character at the end, but the really wretched figure at the beginning. I played that several times, and I found myself enjoying the wretched part of Ebenezer Scrooge more than the redeemed part. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe it just gave me a chance to emote in ways that I don't normally do. Uh, but I was just curious, because you, you're an actor who does... Anyone who watches you, Nate, I mean, this is just my armchair critique, is not imagining, they're lost. They're not seeing Nate anymore. Of course, that's your ambition. You, you, they're, mm-hmm. they're lost mm-hmm. in the person you're representing. But in order to do mm-hmm. that, you have to emote and feel uh, the character's mm-hmm. uh, life. And and I just I, my, my question was just aimed at, you, ha- you have excelled at heroic figures, and your outstanding mm-hmm. film work has, has inspired and I'm hearing you say, yes, you would take a role where you might have to play the other side of the street so the story can be told uh, mm-hmm. in a way that that is true and honest and compelling. Fair? Yeah. And yeah. As we said, that you know, the Lord wastes nothing. Yeah. You, you know, and, and the this, this story that, need, that needs to be told is the story. If there were only heroic characters, there'd be no reason to tell yeah. stories. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think um, given that, you know, I always say, just give me the script and let me see what I can bring to it. My biggest fear always in the arts is that I will let down the person that is needing me to give them what they've been praying for. That kind of, it, that kind of came off a little, you know, um, I don't mean it in that way, but if it's Nat Turner and someone's saying, you know what I mean? Like some, someone's, when we turn on the television, we turn on a screen, we're looking for something. Sometimes it's validation, sometimes it's comfort. There are things that we're looking for. Um, but when you're, you're, you know, there are people on the other side that are looking for you to tell the truth because in telling the truth, you, can, you, 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 you redeem them or tell their truth or redeem someone they love. So it's a big responsibility. It's not just getting on screen and being natural. It's recognizing that someone will identify with you and they will watch you like a hawk and they will watch you for a false beat. And if you're false at any moment, whatever you could have, they could have gained from you that they were they were looking for, mm-hmm. they lose in an instant. It turns yeah, into yeah. a vapor. Um, and that's why, you know, some of the things that that we enjoy, that we watch, that move us the most are things that we saw the type of truth that was uncontested and it, and it spoke to our spirit. A couple just random questions, Nate. What's one of the best movies you've ever seen? I would say one of the best films, are, there are a number of them. Um, Malcolm X is always at the top of my list. Mm-hmm. Always at the top of my list. You know, because? I think that um, because of his, because of his desperation, to stand in what he believed, you know, I think it's a, it's a remarkable example, mm-hmm. you know, of a riotous disposition. You know, the people as our ancestors, as I call them, that <clears throat> walked into the, the flame or stood in front of the firing squad, that I would be here talking to you, that we'd be talking about a film that 
has had an impact on you or someone else mm -hmm. that they stood me up that their trajectory looking back on it is the the lifeblood of my experience um a film like that what Denzel did with that role you know it was it was extraordinary you know and, and to the point where when you think of Malcolm X you see Denzel Washington first yeah. in your mind <laughs> yeah 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 he 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 became the face uh he became and, the face and yeah. still if you were going to listen to some music just to chill, what do you want to hear? Maybe Thelonious Monk. Um, defi definitely Louis Armstrong, something. I don't know if it's my age, but um, lately I'm leaning away from words. So mm -hmm. even when I'm relaxing, the thoughts that I'm having are active because I think sometimes words can kind of control your thinking. And not always for the good, you know. It's like my kids will say, "No, I'm just looking, listening to the beat, not the words." I'm like, "That's impossible," <laughs> you know. You're being you're being coded right you're now. You're being coded. So <laughs> jazz great, is, yeah, right now, you know. Yeah. So Miles Davis, you know, Nina Simone, like jazz is, you know, and, and, and with Nina Simone, obviously there are words there, but she speaks to the the tragedy of life, mm -hmm. um, in a way that's so spiritual and so haunting, but at the same time so. Um, encouraging you know sometimes we have to re be reminded that things are not all good there's some there's more work to be done uh but yeah i am um, and obviously lately you know because of my household having five children is difficult in that peace is not always something you to enjoy so we do have our morning to be in worship before school you know or once in a while to just how old what's your oldest said your, your oldest and youngest child what's the age span my oldest is 24 and my youngest is six. Wow. Well, that, that'll that keep you young there, nice. I promise. And all right. Yeah, it's you, busy, that's sure. When you were an athlete, you were a wrestler. Uh, you excelled at wrestling, right. both uh, as a young man and into college and so on and so forth. Uh, do you see, do, how does wrestling, does it speak to your spirit? Mm. Because, you know, in the scripture, it talks about wrestling with uh, the unseen realm. Do you ever think about that? Do you find yourself... Like, yes, I, I know what it means to be pinned and to pin uh, in a wrestling match. All the time, you know, so much of everything that I am, I owe to wrestling with respect to work ethic and, and discipline. You know, I always say that if you can turn your plate down, it's like wrestling you fast all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. You can't. I wrestled you can't relax. Not a lot. Well, no fasting. You're not allowed yeah, to eat. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, certain yeah, that's people, right. yeah. like doing a perfect diet, and uh, and there's something spiritual about that. You know, mm -hmm. wrestling is the oldest sport, um, but what it instills in young people, specifically. You know, my two youngest daughters just started wrestling, which is the oddest thing. And without me asking them to, without me bringing it up, it was just like they're going to go to this thing. I'm like, what? I went, and now they're they're in it. But what it teaches you about from the physical, how to control, you know, self-control, how to control your body, the discipline, um, you know, how to discipline, how to respect your body, how to train your body to do the, the do things that, 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 uh, you know, that, re that require real sacrifice. Um, what it means for the psychological part of you, you know, they say you're, there's your, there's so much your body can endure that you don't even know. And wrestling takes you to the brink. It really does. It, it, you know, I wrestled mm -hmm. injured. I remember my freshman year, I blew my shoulder out. I wrestled with a disconnected shoulder. And um, but it's it is a spiritual journey. Wrestling. It's one-on-one. It's, -on -one. it's you and another person under a light. There's no one to save you, and you learn so much about yourself. Mm -hmm. How far you're willing to go, and then you make you. I, I've applied all those things to life. You know, filmmaking is not easy. It's very difficult. Remarkably difficult. Um, you know, uh, and now I coach still, I coach wrestling. I try to introduce as many kids to wrestling. It's the same thing. I have a foundation called the Nate Parker Foundation that is all about putting cameras in the hands of young, men, you know, women and men of African descent to teach them to tell their story because this this device, this mm -hmm. this this machine um, that we that we so underuse has been used since you know the early 1900s to to shift culture. And, uh, and I want people to have that tool, not in, underestimate it. So between wrestling and filmmaking, I feel like I've found the two most important um, ways in which you can affect change that exists to man, in my opinion. In Hollywood, 
Hollywood's a big word, covers a lot of ground. Do you think you face, uh, everyone faces challenges, no matter what our story, but your challenges, uh, are, are they magnified because you're a black man or a Christian? Or are those even appropriate questions? Are there, is there a difference? Yeah, I think, you know, James Baldwin said to be black and in America and even relatively conscious is to be in a constant state of rage, you know? So I don't think that racism is specifically a Hollywood problem. I think that America is America. The yeah. United States the United States. The history is the history. The now is the now. The dysfunction is the dysfunction. And the solution set is still in motion. Um, there are many challenges in Hollywood. There are challenges with being black and coming to a town where none of the roles are positive. They all perpetuate uh, a negative representation mm -hmm. of the people that you love in the world that you know are not like the people you're being asked to portray. Mm -hmm. um, but those things are a choice as well, you know, uh, where you engage uh, around either succumbing to those projections or stepping out on faith and and, and kind of looking to, to to follow those who have come before you and done it the right way and or in some some circumstances plays your own way. You know, I particularly have, have had challenges in, in, in Hollywood in, in, in different ways, you know, uh, and all of those things have have really uh, forced me at times to, to go to my knees in prayer about what how I continue forward in a way that uses the tools that I've been given as a man, as a filmmaker, as an artist to best achieve what the Lord has set out for me in this short span of time called life. Um, and so with all of my challenges, and there have been many, I, I attack them all with prayer. I think that the biggest cheat sheet we have is the Bible. Um, and the Holy Spirit is the, the best ally that we can ever align them. And, and these are things that I believe, you know, um, with mountain moving faith, that makes sense. So, you know, my, my, my approach to my life as an artist, my approach to my life as a human, my approach to my life as a, as a husband, as a father, as a filmmaker, um, as a deeply flawed man is all about, you know, um, desperation and, and, and completing my, my destiny for this, on this planet in doing so in a way that I was humble uh, and that I recognize accountability and responsibility uh, and that I grew in that whenever I'm gone, because it says in the word, the life is a vapor, it's a mist, that those who come behind me that can gain something from the few years that, that, that I stood tall for what the Lord expected me to do. I heard you quoted, uh, Nate, saying that you, you don't like to take projects that build walls. You want to take them down. That, uh, that's right. You, that's part of the lens of your evaluation. You, you clearly are a person who believes in the power of positive, constructive revolution. In other words, there are dares and risks to be assumed, but there are changes that need to be made, and they cannot be made if we play it safe. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as you have also described yourself with a deep faith, a kind of increasing, I, I have a sense of Nate Parker as like, you know, day by day, year by year, he's got more understanding of what it means to be a Jesus guy or to be a person who's in, in the covering of Jesus and the calling of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I have two last questions for you. What would you say to someone listening today who just thinks Jesus is a waste of time? And the second question is, mm -hmm. what would you say to someone who thinks Jesus is Lord? What would you tell them to do? So first up, what would you say to someone who just thinks that whole Jesus thing is a waste of time? I would say hold the Lord accountable. That's the beauty of Christ, is that he, he shows up when we ask him to. Um, I've been in this situation several times more than several times if I look across the kind of trajectory of my life where people are like, I heard you talk about Jesus. I mean, isn't that like, you know, the white man's God or isn't that whatever? And I was like, the Jesus I serve was well before we start using words like white and black. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jesus I serve <laughs> is, a, is, is, is supersedes any type of uh, uh, physical earthly understanding, you know, like trying to explain the Lord's power and grace is like trying to explain the internet to an ant, right? Like we're learning day by day. Um, and so I would just say, 
call them out. I always tell people, call them out. Get on your knees and call, call Jesus out and see what happens. Just do it. Just get on your knees and say, you know what? I'm hearing a lot about you. This is a, this is, this is a God that was in the flesh, right? That he might understand where we are and where we stand and what we're experiencing. So I don't think that it says in the Bible, when you, when you pray to the Lord, you don't have to use all these big words and all this rhetoric like the Pharisees do. I hold God, God accountable in my life all the time, plenty of times. <laughs> You know, over the last specifically six years, I've looked up and be like, all right, God, what are we doing? I need I I need today for I'm going to open this book and I'm going to leaf through it. And I need you to guide me exactly to what I need to see to deal with this feeling in the pit of my stomach, because I feel like I feel like I'm following, but I'm it's, it's gotten a little quiet. I think that we are called you know, to call on the Lord for answers. Lord, I don't understand. And specifically for the non the person that is saying is a waste of time that is open, kneel down with an open heart and say, if you are real, show me. Because I think that's a seed. Mm -hmm. That's biblical. You call on the Lord, he'll show up. It's honest. For the person that is, huh? It's that's honest. Right. Yeah, it's authentic. That's exactly right. And and he is a promise keeper. He will not, if your heart is in the right place, let you down. I am living proof. Um, for the Jesus is person, um, I would say, seek your destination and you will get your job well done. But you have to seek that destination with a, with a reckless abandon. Because then... Then the left and the right doesn't matter, right? It doesn't even matter. The life and the death doesn't matter because your eyes are set and you. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Excuse me. There's nothing. But you hit a point. I've hit a point of faith no. where I am, I am, I am, I am so unafraid of death or anything that could come to me because I know that it's written that nothing can separate me from the love of Christ and what he wants for me and what he has called me to do. There is nothing, you know, I demolish every argument it stands against his word. I take captive every thought. I would tell that person that is a Jesus is person to get the word in your spirit. It is the only thing that makes us bulletproof. So when that, that word lives on our heart, it lives in our mind. It says, it says it countless times, get the word inside and you will so not only survive, but you will thrive and you will reach that place of well done. Everything else is distraction because only the things we do for Christ will last. And I'm saying that to myself. All the other stuff is just other stuff. So hopefully the person that needs to hear that hears it from someone who has experienced it, lives it in real time. Nate, uh, it's been a terrific experience for me to just uh, be in conversation with you. Thank you for being such a gracious and uh, honest and uh, compelling voice. I've used that word compelling more often in this interview than I have in a lifetime, but that's just the nature of who you are. You're a compelling figure and your passion is just, uh, it, it reaches across time and space. That said, uh, I know that you've achieved some great success by the world's measure, no matter what people say, uh, you have achieved great success within your profession in, in multidimensional ways. You're not just an actor. You're not just a director. You're not just a screenwriter. I mean, this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, transcends the craft. Mm -hmm. And I know that when you achieve success, uh, while I think many people think counterintuitively, well, then it gets easier. It doesn't get easier. It gets more challenging. No. It becomes more difficult. And I think uh, mm -hmm. you've tasted some of that. But thank you for staying on the task, on point. And uh, yes, mm -hmm. I think uh, watching films that I'm familiar with of Nate Parker, 
makes me better and makes me want to make the world better. And thank you for mm. making those. Mm. Keep keep doing that. All right. Mm. Is there another? Just are you giving a, a hint of what's next? Is there another great film coming up, or you're still shopping? yeah? Um, you know, I there are a couple things coming. You know, I I made a film with a very powerful man of God named David Oyelowo. Uh, you'll know him from portraying Dr. King in Selma. Okay. Um, one of my best friends in the world, if not my best friend. And uh, we did a film together that shines a light on the broken uh, prison industrial complex, specifically solitary confinement and the inhumane aspects of that torturous pra practice and how it's impacting so many people. You know, in any given day, there are 80,000 men, women, and children in solitary confinement. Yeah. And what that does to the human spirit, you know, in this 23 hour lockdown in a, you know, nine by 11 foot room. And so we, we sought to tell this story in a way that would uh, illuminate uh, the practices in this space and hopefully uh, be additive to the conversations around ending solitary confinement as a practice. That film is now made and will come out at some point, uh, either the end of this year or next year. Um, it's finally done. And, uh, and I'm working on something else that's very big that I think is probably the biggest thing I've ever been involved with um it's a it's a business it's it's within the industry but it's really about elevating the voices of people of the culture mm -hmm. um specifically like black culture inspired content um you know that i believe will be the tide that raises all ships um telling the stories that are often often go untold or are told by people who don't have a vested interest in mm -hmm. the success of those stories um but the next year will be a, a very uh, fulfilling one, no matter what happens, because I've spent so much time uh, doing what I believe God has called me to do in this in this industry, in this space. Thanks for doing it. Oh, and by the way, thanks for being faithful at church mm -hmm. at Center of Hope. Just I'm just saying, it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a great it, this Center of Hope Church, uh, the corner of Crenshaw and Hardy in Ingle Inglewood. Um, it's if one you're of the most remarkable, if you're ever in the neighborhood, places. you guys drop in. I've been there. I know of oh, what you speak. Please, yep. Please, Nate Parker. Thanks so much again. Oh. Be encouraged and God bless today always. Thank you so much. I remain honored and, and humbled to be able to to commune with you and your audience. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Godspeed. For more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.